people are familiar with because that's how they're surviving. Yeah. And Jim, I don't want to interrupt what's a very important conversation. Good for you. No, go ahead. It's your meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it's just 7 30. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to September's mid month meeting. And Kyle, I think you're going to kick us off with some. Well, sure. Uh, so, uh, good good morning. Welcome um, uh, to the uh, September 14th Planning Commission Mid Month Meeting. I am Kyle Kobe. I will be helping facilitate this video portion of the meeting. Um, joining us is uh, Jeff Crick, uh, Planning Development Services Director. We will have some special guests as well. Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves when they're about to go. Um, we will be working alongside the vice chair to help facilitate the meeting. Um, this meeting will be uploaded to the city's YouTube channel. Um, please remember to mute yourself during the meeting when you're not speaking. Um, the chat function for the meeting will be disabled. All chats will go directly to me. Uh, unless you're participating during the meeting, please turn your video off. This allows the active meeting participants to be on the screen. Just to be able to hear the meeting when you are participating, please turn your video on. If you have any trouble, you can send me a chat. Um, the city reserves the right to mute or turn individual, individual videos off to minimize distractions during the meeting. And that is all of the script that applies, so I'll turn it back over to you. Kyle, thanks a million. Um, our uh, September mid-month meeting um, is uh, largely designed for um, uh, discussion and, and diving deep into different topics, largely about education, about uh, matters that might be specific. We won't cover anything in, in formal business. And we will talk about any items that are, are open items for the, for the city or the county. Um, so I'd ask you to please keep that in mind. Um, we uh, don't have formal public comment set up, but if there is someone from the public that is here that at the end of each topic um, has something to uh, contribute, we'll offer three minutes for them to, to ask, but it won't be a part of the formal discussion that we have. And with that, unless there's any questions, we have two topics today, um, one around um, bikes and one around safe routes to schools. And I think, Paul, you're going to kick us off with a conversation on bikes. Great. Thank you. So first, quick introduction. My name is Paul Hornbeck. <clears throat> um, here with J Jessica, and we're with the Lawrence Douglas County Metropolitan Planning Organization. We do long-range <laughs> transportation planning for all of Douglas County. So that is Lawrence, unincorporated Douglas County as well as Eudora, Baldwin City, Lecompton. Um, I've been here only since March, so I'm still learning and was not here during these, when we created these plans. Jessica was, so she can take all the credit or blame for, for the plans and you can probably answer more in-depth questions that you may have, but I will give you um, an overview. So we have two plans, the Lawrence Bikes plan, as well as the countywide bike plan. And so, yeah, yeah. Pull that up. And I, I, if you want to give me the mouse, I can run through it. Or that's Yeah, so we have the two plans. Um, Lawrence Bikes was adopted in 2019. The countywide bike plan was adopted in, in 2021. And the reason for updating the plans, we're on kind of a five-year rotation with all of our plans. So the bike plans, uh, pedestrian plan, safe routes to school, the other plans. Oh, lots. Okay. <laughs> so we try and update to those every five years. Um, some of the, the key components of the bike plan or bike plans is creating a low stress network that works for all ages and abilities. Um, and this update was also focused on, on implementing that as well as bringing in some of the national design standards to help, help create that um, network that's a low stress, um, high comfort for all ages and abilities. Um, so community engagement is a big part of our process. Uh, we have a public engagement plan that we follow for all of our processes. And so developing these plans, we, we follow the, the process that's outlined in our public engagement plan. Um, so these plans have a steering committee 
that helps guide the process and help help us um, vet our ideas and give us some direction. Um, we have a robust engagement process with each community. So Lawrence, Douglas County, this, the small cities, um, there's a, a public comment period, a 30 day public comment period. Once the plan is developed and we have it posted and available for review. So engagement consisted of open houses, guided bicycle rides, mobile meetings, as well as a survey. Uh, the survey had over 600 responses. Um, and I mentioned we have the two separate plans. <laughs> they started as, as one kind of combined bike plan for Lawrence and the, and the county. Uh, they were split during the process to uh, get better engagement with the, with the small cities. Uh, we found that doing the Safe Routes to School with the bike plan um, gets, gets the kids engaged and, and parents engaged. So that was uh, a big part of the, the countywide plan. Paul, Charlie Thomas. So I am new to this. <clears throat> so you're saying you're meeting with the cities, Baldwin, Eudora, Lecompton. What about just the unincorporated areas? Where, where, yes. where does the input come there? How do you meet with... So the people. steering committee for the, for the countywide bikeway plans was the MPO Bicycle Advisory Committee, and it has representation of two, I believe, two appointed positions that are appointed by Douglas County. And so the that they serve as the liaisons for what would we would consider Douglas County, whether they do it or not, would be their prerogative in that. Um, when we do engagement, of course, we're doing it to try to cover, you know, to, tar to target everyone in the sense that we use all popular news media or other things there. I don't, you know, like for any citizens, it's like the Lawrence and Douglas County to try to get engagement. So we would hope that people would engage in that way. When you do this type of planning, that's very specific to a user group. Typically the people who participate in these processes are people who are cyclists. And oftentimes we're reaching out specifically to their networks um, so regardless of where they live in the county, if they're part of, of the bicycle club or they bicycle, you know, a bicycle club in Baldwin City or Eudora, um, we would catch whoever we would catch in some of those user groups. And the reason I ask is I live west of Lone Star Lake out in the southwest part of the county. And um, are, are the people that live out there or how again specifically do they get to give input they would be asked to give input just as anyone when we advertise and do all of our relations related to like lawrence and douglas county bike plan update so a lot of people were probably catching because they're targeted use they're targeted users they're already interested in bicycling or they bicycle or Honestly, they dislike bicycles. Those are a lot of the people who, when you, they see a bike plan update, they want to come and be excited to give input to this process. So we, they would have to see something that we did in any of our public relations. There's not a specific meeting location that was necessarily there. They would have to either be an, be an audience that was targeted because they're interested in bicycling or be just part of the target of the city countywide efforts. Okay. Is it fair to say that when you organize communication, you try to do that around the communities that have an interest as opposed to just the community at large? Or Yeah, so it's some of both. Some things like when we do the 30-day public comment period, that's getting, you know, you're we're publishing a public new press release in the newspaper or putting out, you know, our email list. And we have hundreds of members involved in our transportation planning or bicycle planning. We would reach out like for these plans, we went and talked to um, any specific user or group that would have an interest in bicycling. So um, in you terms of like, 
yeah, like, you know, they have ride lawns, you know, um, that the central rotary operates or bike clubs or those sort of things. And we have members of our, on our advisory committee, help us do that because they are plugged into these different communities. So the cyclists in Baldwin city and Eudora or, um, in our county representatives, we actually have had at that time when we were doing this plan, had somebody on the committee that lived in unincorporated Douglas County who, was a member of a bike club and was representing um, those interests. And he's someone who actually commutes or, you know, at the time did commute for work from unincorporated parts of the county into the city. And so um, we get a lot of that feedback from the representative people that we have on the steering committee. <laughs> when we form those, we try to cast the broadest net that we can to try to get a lot of different perspectives from um, somebody who, you know, maybe in town biking, we try to get parents who may be biking with kids to, you know, to get kind of all ranges to understand a lot of perspectives. Are we going to maybe have, you know, knowing that we have one or two spots in the unincorporated, you know, for Douglas County to a point, does that maybe going to represent everyone? No, but our goal is to try to get an understanding of a broad perspectives of cycling. Just while we're on the topic, I sure. think can interrupt so much, but the, um, I'm wondering about this, the, the kind of piggybacking on what Charlie's thinking. Um, I would think a valuable community, and, and you might have reached out to this community, people who would like to bike but are, are not part of it because they're too afraid. They're, they're too unsure. Um, they don't know how to bike in town. Because I run into a lot of yeah. people. So <laughs> have a couple together. minutes, let okay. me show you on the slides because yep. we heard from a lot of people. <laughs> okay. Okay. And so I think you'll see that in some of the response of what we heard from people. All right. So in the community engagement process, there's some major themes that we did, did hear about, uh, both benefits and barriers to, to bicycling. I'll talk about barriers in a minute. Some of the benefits that we hear from the community is the personal health benefits of, of exercise, um, environmental impacts of um, getting around by bicycle, um, just enhancing their mobility options. People that maybe don't have a car, but, you know, biking allows them to, to reach a lot more destinations or reach bus stops and, and things like that, as well as similarly equity. And um, yeah, so those are some of the uh, benefits, um, some of the barriers to bicycling that we heard from surveys are um, summarized here, the top five for, for each plan. Um, there's a lot of overlap between the two. Um, aggressive speeding drivers being a big one in, in both Lawrence and, and countywide. Um, weather, obviously, we can't do anything about, but uh, things like building dedicated facilities, um, trying to improve the roadway conditions or building a connected network are all, all things we can have some control over and work to improve. Could you go back just for just a second, please? I just want to consume that. Thank you. And, and to back up for a second, so this this is oh, <laughs> so for the um, Lawrence, Lawrence survey, we had about 573 responses to that Lawrence specific, and um, about 45 for the, the county wide. Is that good? I think it's pretty reasonable for the level of effort that we are able to put in with two full time staff and two interns. Okay. without a lot of additional staff interest and like ability to table because a lot of this engagement we're getting because we are tabling at existing places people are so we're going to community events we're going to the library and just open tabling gotcha. and literally talking to every person that we can get to i mean we get probably a majority of all of our surveys through every survey process come to us in paper and we input we're inputting data so based on our capacity we feel like this is gotcha. pretty reasonable. I think it's also fair to say is the amount of work Jessica can pull do with two people and two interns is better than some places do with five people and 10 interns. So it's a very high productive effort they do with two people. 
Yeah, and we were really blessed in this process because members of the committee came out and tabled with us. They went on, you know, they helped go on rides with us um, of our steering committee because they're also very passionate about this work um, and helped us frame some of the work we're doing and listen to concerns because they're also advocating in other ways related to some of the planning work that we have done, like things like the Lawrence and Douglas County rideability map. So they, they also, I think, have a value in listening and hearing what other people are saying outside of their own single bike bicycling perspective. And so many of those members helped us um, table and do events, which expands our capacity. So this survey question asked people if, if they would ride their bicycle more often if they um, felt they could do it safely. So this is kind of to your point about uh, most people who maybe don't feel safe or comfortable. Um, in both Lawrence and County, 71% of respondents said they strongly agreed or somewhat agreed that um, they would ride more if they could do it safely. Um, so level of comfort really relates to this and whether it's real or perceived safety. Um, and we'll get into kind of design standards and how to, how to create a higher level of comfort and higher safety for people as we go on. So our, our next question, um, comfort bicycling on different forms of bicycle facilities. And so on the left, we have the different type of facility, uh, protected bike lane or cycle track being kind of the safest and most, most, uh, most comfortable and most uh, separated from traffic and vehicles. Um, not surprisingly, that's uh, the most comfortable for people. 73% of people say they're very comfortable on that type, type of facility. Um, and then going down the list, uh, buffered bike lane is, is just a bike lane um, with a little bit of a separation, um, but no physical barrier from traffic. Um, there's a small section of that on, on mass streets, just uh, by South Park. Um, so 44% of people, um, and then just going down the list to conventional bike lane or a shared lane marking or, or no facility, obviously the comfort gets less and less. And, and this was a visual preference survey. So we gave people oh. pictures of facility and asked them, how comfortable would you feel mm -hmm. on this? We did it both for commercial streets and local streets because that matters too. So we had two separate lists to kind of start to understand as people are responding, how would they feel if that they were in this kind of space? Because I think not everybody knows what those mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was... Um, Lawrence, and then <laughs> next slide is the countywide and um, pretty similar results. I would not have called the one on Massachusetts Street. I didn't think that was called a buffered one. There's sections of it, it that has a, it has a buffer. And that's considered a buffer, that space. The space. The space, the space is space. considered a buffer. To get to protect, protect <laughs> that's when you have a buffer, but it has a physical something in it. So like an armadillo, one of those rubber armadillos, oh. that's all bolts to the ground or uh, like a flex post. Like that's you, what they would call it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so next question is just asking about what, what should be prioritized um, and asking if we should equally prioritize the needs of people with bicycle, other travel modes. And 75% of the respondents and wards agreed that um, bicycling should be equally prioritized with other travel modes. County was a little bit less, um, 64%. These are the same people, though, that were providing feedback on biking in general. So probably that community as opposed to the community at large. Yes. All right. Yeah. And we, we understand that, like in this thing, but we're trying to, I think, start to show the conversation about as we're talking about bicycling in relationship to other things, where should they lie? And right now, bike head as part of like the overall transportation budget is like 2%. So there's still a lot of room for improvement to before we even get to equal, I think, to show that there's increasing value of importance on for people, for safe facilities for future sure. bicycle. So the next slide has vision and goals for the Lawrence Bikes Plan, um, improving safety, um, and regarding fatalities and serious injuries, the goals have zero through 2025. And as of 2021 data that continued to be zero. So that's good. So increasing ridership. Um, so this, this one's kind of hard to measure. The census does ask a, a question on primary uh, 
commute method. And as of uh, 2021, it was 1.3% of, of people using bicycle. Um, the goal is to get it um, 3% by 2025. And bike to school, is on, um, the goal is 5% by 2025. And as of 2021, it was 3.7. Um, this does vary a lot between, from school to school. They do um, kind of surveys at each school or counts at each school to, to gauge that. Um, Sunflower um, has an 8.6% and on the high end, and Schwegler is around a half a percent. Um, and there's also, Jessica will talk about people walking to school, but that's also a big big part of that as well. And we wanted to kind of give you those examples, I think, because in your mind, you can think about where those schools may be located. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of different barriers for some schools in terms of roadways, right? Um, Clinton Parkway, Iowa, in terms of uh, Schweigler versus a school that may be more neighborhood focused. So they could either consolidate the catchment area, like in Sunflower, you've mm -hmm. got Clinton Parkway, which kind of creates the neighborhood. Right. Whereas Schweigler, you've got 23rd Street, which kind of divides it. Mm -hmm. um, other other goals are to increase access. So the percentage of population within a quarter mile of what we call level of comfort three or better. Um, and we'll, we'll show kind of what the level of comfort in some of those facilities are. Uh, and then the low stress network, uh, as well as increasing uh, the mileage of the of the low stress bikeways to forty six percent. That means the grade. How hard it is to ride it? No, that that's actually the level of stress that we we measure by the volume of traffic and speed of traffic. Oh, okay. So high stress is going to be on a, a busy fast road. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, cool. I really did not understand what that meant. <laughs> So the countywide plan also has uh, vision and goals. Um, so these to talk about um, fatalities and injuries again. Um, also talks about signage. Uh, Douglas County specific is improving separation and distance um, from roadside safety. Very, um, whenever there's a project, 100% of the time, making those improvements when it's identified as a future bikeway. Um, Baldwin City has a, a goal of increasing their mileage in Eudora similarly. So we also have action plans that kind of are, are steps for implementing these projects. So I know you can, can't read those. Yeah. Paul, can, can, tell me about the signage. Um, so I wrote... Before I moved here, I rode my bike to work for years and years in a very populated area. My sense from the people that talk to me out in the country is there is such, I don't want to say distaste. Uh, some people say bicycles should not be out in the country. Uh, riding out there, but I never see any signage that is, and I'm talking about the blacktop that goes out to Lone Star, Clinton, and, and circles around the still. It says, be friendly, bike friendly. And do, what plans are there for the signage that you're talking about out in the country? Would a, would a sign do that? It can't hurt. I will tell you that. We have educational signs that are approved. So this, we don't talk about it in this, and oh. we don't have well, we don't have the map shown and the talk about in this presentation. But the work we did with um, the bicycle advisory committee really talked about instead of just like bike friendly or share the road signs, what actually they would prefer and what they're kind of looking at is more effective because Kansas has a three foot passing law is to put up the legal three foot passing law signs. Um, and we did some work to identify locations throughout the county where those should be installed and it's in the plan. The next step is really figuring out, I think, prioritizing and budgeting those for implementation, which we haven't seen happen yet. Um, 
Additionally, not in the county, but in the urban areas, the city of Lawrence budgeted in their capital improvement plan for next year, wayfinding work related to bike and ped um, and doing some study of that. So I would assume in terms of some of the larger signage picture um, throughout the county that some of that may become part of a larger conversation. Okay. We have some provisions. It's really up to at that point, you know, some the local governments to implement those. And we've had some conversation about at different times about um, trying to, you know, look for to, to uh, project how much that would cost and look for some grant money to do a one time installation of stuff. And it's on the list, but I think it's just hasn't it hasn't happened. It, it just cannot hurt to have anything that says. I mean, three feet is not is not enough room anyway. But to pull over, bicycles have just as much right to be on the roadway as you do in an automobile. But anything that that says that. Now, I will. This is an aside, perhaps. Lone Star Church. We just built a, built a pavilion at the church. Very lots of cyclists come through there, and we are talking about. How can we use the church and that as a stop for cyclists on the way out and including a restroom out there that they could have access to? Mm. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yes. If you host a pancake breakfast, that'll be there. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we do that. But, but just on a regular day to have that available to cyclists is one of the things we are talking about doing. Okay. That's really cool. uh, and I think other churches, whether it be Warden, which is harder to get to, Stull, uh, the Clinton Church, if you're talking about going. But I think the churches, this, the country churches can play a role in, in the helping cyclists' um, destination. Uh, oh, yeah, gosh, all we have to do is get out to Lone Star and stop, get a drink, use the restroom, do whatever, and head back. And we're going to talk with uh, some of the organizers of the bicycle rides about how we can be helpful. Um, that's... I don't know where all that yeah, fits in. I think it does fit in. And I think that, I think, you know, that's one example, but I think there's probably a lot of private business, private entity responsibility for supporting cycling culture in our community. And whether that's from an employee perspective in terms of offering showers or having, you know, secure interior bike parking for long things. We, you know, we do other work besides just some of these big, uh, city or county bike plans, and one of which is, you know, downtown parking assessment for bikes and other things. And we hear about a lot of those things from individual employees and employers. Um, programmatically, though, that work doesn't fall on anybody's plate. This is where it becomes really challenging. So as the MPO, we do planning work and we can get involved in some of the implementation. But when it gets to operation of some of these programs, it really falls beyond the scope of our role as regional planners. And so without building networks of support and relationships in all of the local governments and having them want to prioritize these things or having a local advocacy group, um, like a lot of people model the one in Missouri called PedNet, um, without having some of that local interest in advocacy, arranging some of these things and working on some of this cultural stuff, it becomes really hard to implement. And it just then oftentimes we find it sits in the plan. And we experience that here. I think a lot of cities experience that until they get a more professional level advocacy group that's doing some of this work very intentionally in parallel um, with the local governments. So some of the major steps for implementing the plans is uh, incorporating bikeways into roadway projects whenever there's a um, a road that needs to be to redone or expanded, whatever, incorporating bikeways with that. Um, also standalone bike projects, uh, grants and private funding. You know, Jessica mentioned, I think around 2% of the transportation budget goes towards bike and ped 
normally. So grants can, can really help um, advance projects. Um, leveraging private development to also make necessary improvements. Um, safe routes to schools and Jessica will talk more about that. Uh, maintenance of bikeways and then traffic signal prioritization. So county also has a, an action plan of um, different steps to take for the cities and, and not incorporated. Uh, so there's education enforcement, evaluation, uh, engineering, And then next we have our existing and planned network. So this map maybe takes, it takes a minute to digest. Um, so the, the blue line is our priority network that's been identified as kind of the top level of or our highest priority to implement. Um, some of it's already built. You can see when it's a solid line, um, like the Lawrence Loop where it's out west where it's green. Up, up north where it's dashed, it's uh, planned. Uh, yellow is the secondary network, which is the next highest priority. And then the things that are uh, not highlighted in blue or yellow are, are also priorities, but um, it's not. Is the blue dedicated path not on the road? Sorry, not, not, not necessarily, no. So there's the- How do you differentiate? The smaller line inside. So okay. green where it's, where it's a shared use path off the roadway. Um, um, red is okay. my claim. <clears throat> okay. So as Paul's gonna get into talking about, because you can see the future facilities, we just say this should be a future bikeway. Uh -huh. And that changed from the previous plan because the previous plan, um, we had uh, some consultants come in and do, and they said, oh, this should be a future bike lane. This should be a future this, should, this should be a future that. Well, we would get into implementing and we'd be like, well, we don't have right away, or that's not really the level of comfort that we need for this roadway because maybe it's changed in terms of operational characteristics with speed and volume. And so we tried to create a plan that's more adaptive. And what it allows for is anywhere where we you see dashed lines that say future facility, then we're going to show you some design matrix mm -hmm. that bases it on speed and volume. And again, we talked about that level of comfort three. There's a place where that falls on there to say, based if you have a higher volume, higher um, speed roadway, and you're adding a bikeway, you have to add increased protection mm -hmm. to get to that level of three comfort. And so that ties back to kind of creating the policy metric we want but not dictating before we get to do the engineering and community work on that specific roadway project, what element should be there. You know, on that map, this is the first time I've seen the environmental justice zone on a map. Is So is that specific for biking or is that environment for the planning office in general? So the MPO does, in all of our plans, you'll see evaluation of environmental justice zone, or we have another analysis called transportation disadvantaged populations. The environmental justice zone is a federally required provision to understand disparity in transportation distribution of assets and condition, and that is based on low and minority populations based on census data. And we get that from HUD, from housing, from community development block groups. So we use their same layer for low to mod uh, block groups. And the other part of that is minority populations. And so in this, um, in this version of EJ, because we have a new one we're just creating for the TIF, that's at any block group that's over 150% of the uh, average, the county wide average. Um, and so, of course, all of the EJ areas, um, which we'd find in an urban area when we're using county populations for our boundaries, are within the city of Lawrence. Um, and so this, sh this shows you, and we have some provisions when we talk about performance measures, um, about when we're thinking about access or um, to networks and stuff, we show data oftentimes in relationship to the entire city or the entire county and then our EJ areas, because we're starting we're starting, we've started over time and we're continuing to elevate our work into understanding how different communities are impacted by multimodal transportation access. And so the TIP 
um, our transportation improvement program, which is another federally required document we create, which is more like a capital improvement program, but for transportation projects only, that has an, a lot more extensive analysis of um, EJ areas or transit service in relation or project selection in relationship to those areas. Thank you. Um, I saw environmental, I thought wetlands, not socioeconomic. Yeah, it's a federal, environmental justice is a federal term and we also often have to define it yeah. um, in our places. So this map we've shortened for you, but in a lot of them we have definitions on the bottom of them. Just so that commissioner remembers, you also have a definition of environmental justice as part of plan 2040 in one of your sidebars. Thank you. So all, all of our prioritized projects, the blue and yellow, are part of a non-motorized prioritization list that helps build the five-year bike ped CIP capital improvement plan. Um, so there's there's kind of a matrix that helps prioritize which projects should be um, completed first. So, and as you've talked previously to the Multimodal Transportation Commission, that's work that they are doing. We have worked with them to develop a scoring system, a methodology to individually score all of these projects, and they have costs built into that where they're the annual money that the city budgets for um, bike, standalone bike ped projects is getting selected based on approved plans. So it's the pipeline, right? We've done planning. How do we get it to implementation for standalone projects? Um, and so other projects are... Uh, that are not on that list are, we kind of rely on routine maintenance or reconstruction um, development to build out those facilities. Recent examples of, of projects built would be the, projects built in that manner would be 23rd Street being reconstructed now, as well as 19th Street. Um, those are more roadway projects, but they're adding bike facilities with them. And we also have a, a similar map for the, the county area as well. And so, Charlie, this may interest you in the county. You can see the areas that have the blue lines, some of those routes out to Lone Star. And you can see there's more and more, I think, as we go along that have moved from future bikeway to paved shoulder. So as we think about county routes, that spectrum of comfort, those facility types for that is really talking about a, a paved shoulder to give people space, which has safety improvements for all users. From the south end of the dam over to, I call it the Lone Star Corner, that was a great improvement for cyclists right there. And I will tell you, a friend of mine hit and killed the cyclist at the Lone Star Corner. And it is devastating to the, to the driver. Uh, so and that was a great project. To have that. And I think we'll continue to see more of those. We know, for example, the 56 project that KDOT's getting ready to do is going to include paved shoulders. I think because of also design standards for rural roads, that's also increasing the pressure for paved shoulders for roadway safety, for departure safety, even for vehicles. Um, so it's not just a bicycle benefit, um, but we start, we'll start to see, I think, over time, the continued development of paved shoulders in the county, which matters to a lot of people. Is there a copy of this, a hard copy someplace? Yeah, absolutely. Do you want the entire plan or just this map? The entire plan. Yes, absolutely. I would we can do that for you. Yep. So the next slide talks about <laughs> uh, the cross country routes. Uh, as, uh, these are, sorry, my slides are out of order in my notes here. Um, so these are designated largely by, by KDOT or other national groups that are routes that go through Kansas or across the entire country. These are not necessarily um, prioritized locally um, for implementation at the moment, um, but they are, they're, they're more tourism um, and recreation focused than, than transportation focused. The key about these, I think, is these are the routes people are using if they're doing cross-country trips. And so um, regardless of the fact of where they fall in our existing or plan, 
um, this is something new we added to the plan when we did this plan because we hadn't done it before. We hadn't done that in previous plans, but to really recognize and call attention to, we're part of a bigger network and system. And in some places, we we had conversations between um, the Bicycle Advisory Committee and KDOT to, uh, to re-navigate some of these to existing facilities. So in cases where like the Lawrence Loop had been developed through the urban areas, um, move the route to that. So we're directing people to to infrastructure that is the best available to connect to them based on existing conditions. I think there's conversation too about, you know, there could be conversation or local advocacy. I know there's some interest in connecting um, like Baldwin City to Lawrence and some of those things with uh, Baldwin City's work on trail development, they believe trail and trail development, especially their work to the South right now. Um, but I think you could see this is kind of the start of that conversation um, and it will need to continue into the future because there isn't really any active implementation of these outside of each of the local governments, just efforts on their own networks. Okay, so now the next slide uh, talks about um, the different design uh, options, kind of the uh, different types of facilities. So we, we've talked about these, but now we have the images to help better illustrate what those are, as well as the um, facility selection criteria. So I don't know how, how well you can see that, but it, it talks about the, um, the volume and speed and volume is the, the blue line kind of graph and the speed is in the yellow orange. Um, so that when we come to implement projects, we can use this to help decide what type of facility is, is appropriate based on the speed and volume. Um, public comment period, I did mention at the end of these plans is there, we have a final draft ready for review. There's a 30 day period and we open up for, for comments at that time. I think one other thing I may notice that all in all of the plans you find that we do, we have a very transparent documentation of public comments received to us. So sometimes you'll look at our planning document and there are hundreds of pages. And the great thing about that is um, if you use them online, you can word find. So if you're looking for somebody who comments about a certain thing, you can word find to go look for that. If that's ever of interest to you to find out about somebody comment about a particular street or location yeah, okay. or thing as you're doing your work. Um, but also I think it's there, you know, just we try to incorporate and show how we're using that in the plan to drive the conversation that we're setting the tone for. Um, but it also provides transparency and shows people what what we collected so that's all available to you it's available to the public um, and i'd encourage you as you're looking at any issues ever related to some of the, any of these specific topics to go take a look at some of that information do you how do you think about the combination of um, the, the impact of traffic and high volume traffic and making it safe um, when you, when you think about carving off a piece of Mass Street, which is arguably one of our higher traffic streets for bike lanes, when you've got a street that runs north and south, just to the east of it, just to the west of it, is there any thought that says, hey, why don't we choose a path of less resistance? Why don't we choose a path that already has a substantially less amount of traffic and, and work to prioritize that for bike traffic? Not just exclusively for bike, but wouldn't that serve all of the goals that you have? I think there are some different perspectives in relationship to that. There can be options, I think, where a parallel alternative is planned. So in our bikeway plan, as we think about parallel alternatives, 6th Street is a good example of that. Um, from the new signal by Casey's to connect back, we have not called for the bikeway to happen on 6th Street. We've called for the bikeway to happen on 5th Street to connect to Bertram Park, up 5th Street, then back to 6th Street where, where there is no parallel. 5th Street doesn't go through all the way, just like 7th Street doesn't go through all the way. So there's some, there's also some theory to be said for bicycling that you can't do this right? Like this isn't, this is not a good ride. <laughs> and so you have to consider other things like geography and other things too. So things have evolved. We had that same conversation with cyclists 
both community and our bicycle advisory committee in relationship to developing the 21st Street Bicycle Boulevard, where some people said, well, we should just go off one block and you have a route that's less straight um, and develop it there. But I think the reality of that is we have other benefit wins for 21st Street, where you had a local street that was not classified you know, as collector and above, that should have been 19th or 23rd, that that was operating at a higher capacity because the width of the street, people weren't parking on it. It's a neighborhood street, it has driveways. And so really as the direct route, it was decided through that process and think, looking at the network that you also want to provide some direct connectivity for cyclists. And so it's a balance, I think, between benefiting the safety of all transportation users, because I think people who we've heard from people who live on those blocks now that say traffic was calmed also for their benefit, even though they don't bike. And, you know, we branded ours as Bicycle Boulevard. It could be branded as a neighborhood greenway, uh, safe, safer streets. There's other brands to that. And it's about slowing traffic in places where it shouldn't just be necessarily through. To get back to your Mass Street conversation, the city um, has a future CIP project that's going to look at continuing the bike infrastructure from 14th then to the connection. So we've built a signal now to cross Mass Street. Um, and yeah. there's a future, I don't know exactly what year it got programmed in, but there's a future work to be done um, to connect the 21st Street to the 14th Street part. And that's a lot of that is part of prioritizing what we've called the priority network, because you hear in one of the reasons people said there's disconnected facilities or they're not comfortable enough. And so it's really prioritizing that standalone investment of money to make connections. I, I think this, this topic is so important for us and we have to find great ways to get people to and from where they want to go in our city in ways other than a car. I, I'm 100% on board for that. But I also realize we live in a city with a lot of cars and a lot of people who don't have a bike or can't bike or choose not to for whatever reason. It just seems to me that to the degree we can enable both as opposed to, as opposed to trying to find compromise for both at the same spot, but enable fully both it would make sense for us to accomplish all the goals that we have. I think it's going to be a continued conversation we have to have because another uh, street as we talk about that was on the traffic calming list for a decade um, is 13th Street. We have that slated for a few, as a future bikeway. So thinking about that connection from Mass to Haskell to the Loop, um, it's a residential street, has driveways facing it. It's very wide, the local street. Cars are clock traveling 70 miles an hour on that street. Oh, <laughs> um, and so this is, the, this is the, I think this is kind of to your point of, of which cases we have streets already where people operate with unsafe behaviors. Yeah. And when we can develop physical infrastructure that impacts how they operate by narrowing lanes and making dedicated spaces, we benefit everyone, not just bicyclists. So it's not necessarily a compromise, it's to the public benefit of everyone. If It's the same if we think about doing, um, doing chicanes or if we do um, you know, different traffic calming, that, that on a street benefits. A lot, a lot of this argument is that traffic calming is important, but it's a separate conversation from building out a capability for bike traffic in our community. But right? if I might speak to someone who personally bikes up in Massachusetts Street, that is one, if you go over one street east, New Hampshire doesn't go all the way through. I can't well, get to And it's a rough city road hall. to begin with. All, uh, I'm, all I'm saying is you put that same energy and concentrate that on intentional paths and improve that so that it can be. I'm not saying that New Hampshire so, but New is Hampshire doesn't go it. through. Yeah, right. So it's the thing. In the way. There's, no, there's no way to go through all the way through town on New Hampshire. You can do that on Tennessee going one way and Kentucky one way, but no one bikes on Reservoir. They no. shouldn't. No. Um, but so Mass Street is the through north-south street. I mean, that's it, is it through North South Street. And as somebody who bikes on that, I can tell you that it did calm traffic. Not only do I feel safer on that street, traffic is slowed. I mean, I hope, I imagine there's some data to back that up. It's not just my, yes, my I don't perspective know on that. I have yes. to see a biker on that, that shared, that, that the, the bike lane going down Mass oh, Street. Yeah. I have yet to. Oh, that's I've just seen me. That's just okay, me. Well, I bike it. Yeah all the time and I see lots of people. I'd like Good. to see more people. All right. But I still see a lot of people on sidewalks biking because they oh. 
being next to the cars is, and, and certainly with kids, people have got kids, little kids, they're on the sidewalk. Yeah. I, that's where that's I go. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that can be just as dangerous yeah. because you have oh, yeah. driveways and people backing who are not expecting yeah. someone traveling mm-hmm. at the speed of a bicycle yeah. to be yeah. crossing. And so there is a lot of conversation mm-hmm. about moving, um, to some of those lower volume streets where now every driveway is an access point. Or you start having like pedestrian. Yes. And there's a lot of, there's something to be said culturally about designating streets that you want to work for everyone and showing that in a public way, like on Mass Street, as opposed to saying, oh, you're a bicyclist, you go over here. And so I think it's about creating safer spaces for everyone and creating that very visual public culture that we are a community that has streets that work for everyone. Um, I think there's a lot of conversation, but these are the types of conversations that we're having with our bicycles advisory steering committee, people who bicycle all the time from all parts of the community as we talk about what works for them in routing and vision to get to a goal of a comfortable network. It's critically important work. One thing, every time things get narrowed or shut down, you put more traffic on some of the other streets. Now, 19th is called a collector, but it is driveways all the way from the fairgrounds to Iowa. And that street, you're putting more and more traffic on 19th Street, making it less safe all the time. I had to go to 19th because 21st so, changed, yeah. When 21st Street was taken out, was on there. And now with the mess on 23rd Street <laughs> and everything else, 19th Street is... Dangerous. Actually, 19th Street is shut down. Yeah, yeah it's still shut down. For, and it's still, I'm, well, I'm just talking down where I am. <laughs> it's getting worse and worse yeah. all the time. And if it's you're going to shut big, down 13th Street, too, yeah. it's I, at the cost of everyone on 19th Street. I think there's some other things happening, too, with relationship to KU and transit changes that are impacting some of that. Um, transit had this KU transit had to significantly cut service to a lot of their routes, so they don't have the frequency they used to. A lot more people are driving their numbers for ridership for a third of what they were pre-COVID. Yeah. So I, there are, it's not, I mean, we're doing things changing. There's also other changes that are happening, I think, is, that are impacting yeah, trips 19th, on the network. 19th has a painted bike lane that is dangerous as hell because you're driving right over culverts. Mm-hmm. And so most people are on the sidewalks and those are small lots, so many driveways, short driveways. So this is not, it, you're creating it. The situation is just getting worse and worse on that one street. And it just seems to constantly be a good part. <laughs> and now with it being open through the business park or the fairgrounds. So as an example for planning for 19th, so as more and more traffic goes on 19th, would you look at um, the facility that's there now, which is just a painted bike lane? Could that in your planning then eventually as traffic increases? I'm going to guess it already go probably is not a very way. high level of comfort. And it's probably already even already in the plan. Like based on the thing, even if you have a facility like a painted bike lane, if it doesn't meet the level of comfort, when we would go back and touch that street, we would say this doesn't meet the level of comfort. It needs to be three or higher. So just because a bikeway is there does not mean that's the, what the plan calls for us. The bike. So, so it should be there. Be up into another category. Yes. That's Walker, Walker Roos's. Probably a good example of the conversation that's happened there in terms of the next section they're doing where by, you know, the plan, the plan, other part further to the north has existing bike lane on street. And then it was a conversation of, well, that's not, we already know we put bike lane there just not even that long ago in the last five years. Mm -hmm. And that's not meeting our level of comfort in this plan. So to meet the level of comfort, we either need a cycle track or a shared use path. And so what you saw in the future proposed design is shared use path and the transition Mm -hmm. to that facility type. And so I think those conversations are happening. They're happening with the Multimodal Transportation Commission. They are using the tools that we have available in the plan to try to help drive some of these decisions about design that's getting implemented. The other side of that is budget. 
And, and, and I think that's the limitation in some, some places where many of the bike lanes you see out on the street now, they were not because the road was reconstructed necessarily. They were because we did street maintenance and we said, oh, well, we could fit a bike lane in here. And so I would say probably many of those were retrofit situations, not necessarily where we reconstructed or rebuilt, reconstructed a street with a bike lane because 19th is a good example where the bike lane is not very comfortable no. to most people. It not? really, it really serves as traffic calming and narrowing, which does create more space, but that's already a very narrow. They also door. don't have rooms to put in a dedicated bike lane or no. widen that road because yeah. that would put you right in people's living room. Yeah. So and so it's a it's a lot of conversation because people who cycle and feel more comfortable on the, I'm gonna cycle everywhere no matter what, right? They just have more comfort. They say, give us space because it's better for us. And people who don't cycle but would cycle if they could be more safe say, Well, I would never cycle on that. And so it's this balance that not even all the cyclists say the same thing about the facility. And so we kind of um came to the conclusion in the plan with the cyclists that we worked with and from the community that something is better than nothing, but it's not ideal. And the ideal is to build this level of three or higher because you, st you still build a culture by having some of those facilities. And if we can get some of the higher level connections, then maybe you just have to feed in a small part of that to something that's a higher level of comfort. Just a quick check, two things. One, a good time check. Uh, we've got uh, one more topic for about 30 minutes away from a hard stop. And I just want to ask before we, we can talk whatever way you guys want to, I want to check with the folks that are online that are joining us uh, from Zoom. Um, Prasant and Steve, uh, do you uh, have any questions or comments? Make it kind of hard for you to jump in. Yeah, I'm good, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, nothing here. Just taking it all in. I appreciate the time this morning. All right, thanks. I know we had traffic counters out on the, again, the Lone Star Blacktop headed out that way. Do we have bike counters that we know how many people traverse the unincorporated county roads? I do not. To my knowledge, there are not bike ped counts besides some manual ones that we've done in a few spots. Um, there is the technology available. I don't know that the county has ever used it. We have it in the urban areas because as part of neighborhood traffic management, um, the city engineers have purchased some bike ped counters. Um, we're still testing out what that looks programmatically. We haven't gone back and done manual bike ped counts. That's where we put somebody for two hours and there's supposed to be yeah. a methodology. Yeah. The problem is that doesn't work for county trips because we're, those ratios are built on when people are there in urban areas, right? It's a national program that's really targeted to urban areas. And so if I go put somebody out, you know, over lunch on a, it, it doesn't work yeah. um, for the two hour period. So we really would need two counters. Uh, it's something we could talk to the county about. I don't know that they've ever done them. They may before projects. Sometimes if they have a consultant or, you know, they're doing an engineering study before a project, they may. It's not something that feeds into a database I have. Okay. Uh, I, th I think those counting things are, are interesting because it's a chicken or egg issue. Whereas you, if you're looking at a roadway and people don't feel safe biking on it. There's going to be very few bicycles passing that too. Um, so, but if they built it to be safe, there'd be a lot of people on it. So depending on which way you're looking at it, you don't want to have that tube counter determine, well, there's nobody on this road. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, true. And, true. and it is an example of that. When we built the lighted pathway between South Park and campus, um, we did before and after counts of that. And there was like a three to four fold increase of usage by GEMPED together of that corridor the, when they, once they lit it. So it gives you an idea like people, and we, you know, we counted at nighttime hours. We looked when, you know, the lights were on it was, we were, you know, kind of creepy sitting in our car. <laughs> Counting people, <laughs> <laughs> we there before we did that. But um, I think those are some examples of things where you build the case where it's like, yeah, nobody was out walking by. Now we've made this lighted facility, and oh my goodness, people, everybody came to use it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's there's certainly more of a culture in Lawrence and Douglas County of accepting bicycle riders. Like, what in the name of thunder must it be like in whatever towns that don't? I don't have any idea about cycling is 
Okay. Yeah. Well, and this leads into my next topic of safe routes to schools, because I think this is the entry level mm -hmm. for all of those other places, because I think it's really hard for people to debate that, to say that kids should not deserve to be able to bike and walk to school. And land use decisions and school siting around schools in a lot of places have made that not possible um, just because of how that far they've located off on a rural, you know, where land was available or cheap. And um, we are fortunate, I think, and you'll see in some of the stuff we talk about to have neighborhood schools. And I think that's a really big part of a conversation um, that's still going to play out here in relationship to how we do this work. So if you're ready, mm -hmm. Unless you want, you have no public comment. Please jump in. Okay. So we have done safe routes to school planning in Lawrence, Eudora, and Baldwin City. I'm going to talk primarily about Lawrence today, although I can answer questions about any of them. Um, the plan in Lawrence is obviously the most robust because there's the most quantity of schools. Um, safe routes to school is a national framework, so they have a methodology really that's about all the things that safe routes to school should engage. Um, when we did this planning process, um, we had done safe routes to school planning work before, but we didn't write a plan. So we had some maps um, and we had some, oh yeah, there's some different programs happening, um, but there was no written plan. And so the next process when we engage, this is a partnership of City of Lawrence, uh, Public Works, uh, Public Health, USD 497, we invited different private schools to participate, although many of them, because of their disbursement and not having boundaries, don't necessarily have a lot of kids walking and biking. So we got very little participation in that regard. But, um, and just thinking about a coalition about how, you know, what, how, what's law enforcement's role, what's our mission for communication about a lot of different things. So we're think, trying to think holistically about walking and biking to school in relationship to all of these elements. The thing people think about the most is obviously engineering. Is there sidewalk or bike infrastructure, but for kids, mostly sidewalks or crossings um, in relationship to school. Do we have traffic controls or crossing guards? Those are the things that people want to talk about, which is mostly city programming. But I think there, there are other parts of this program. And, and again, when I talked about advocacy and the role of other organizations, so thinking about walking school buses and you know how the community-driven nature of those or volunteer crossing guards as opposed to a paid crossing guard program or student crossing guards, there's a lot of programmatic stuff that could be different based on what some of the other partners would want to participate in based on best practices. We're not there in the, all of those regards, but we have made significant progress in some things. And so we'll talk about those things. Um, we started this process in the winter of 2019 um, and doing some research. We we will talk about our data gathering in the parent survey. Um, we worked with public health a lot to get that into schools. Um, we put together kind of our existing conditions and then we went back to evaluating routes and we have some, we worked with the school district and we'll show you some cool mapping that we did to look at student densities uh, in those boundary areas to make some priority routes. If we're investing our limited resources in gap infill and crossings, let's do it where we can funnel the most kids into routes um, that go to schools. And so we did that for each of the schools. Um, and then we went back out and did some open house and engagement. And we'll talk about that. And then we put it on pause and waited because schools were closed um, before we came back and did some a public final public comment and approval. Um, so like I mentioned, we began a long time ago. Um, and that first effort really was led in 2014 by public health. Um, and no plan was written. We have um, since then implemented a lot of some of the other programming stuff. So bike and walk to school days at, at many of the schools that choose to participate. A big win, I think, is the Lawrence Bicycle Education and Safety Training, which has been incorporated into the curriculum and uh, public uh, Public Health wrote grants and got bike fleets for the school district. They're working on them also. And well, Eudora, I think, has one, and they're working on some for Baldwin City. But that's on bike bike education. And P, um, that's really valuable. It's an equity concern. Lots of kids may not have access to bikes at home. Um, and so this is teaching um, how, to, how to ride, how to do so safely. And um, it, it's really exciting for the kids to get, to get on bikes. Um, and then also we have made some, some, some progress in adding miles of sidewalk gap and crossings. Um, when we talk about what's happening in terms of this data, um, we... That place for just a second. Yes. Back up just one. Yeah. <clears throat> 4.7 miles of sidewalk gap. So, so how does the... How does the how do you think about the policy of sidewalks on both sides of the street? Is that does that factor into 
But when you think about safe routes to schools. It does. So we did, I, I don't have it all in here. It's in the plan. We asked people about what they thought in terms of sidewalks on one side, on two sides, versus if it's an arterial street, a collector street, or a local street. And for the most part, people desired them on both sides regardless. For the purpose of the plan and recognizing that we needed to prioritize our resources, the goals for the plan is sidewalks on both sides of the streets for arterials and collectors and one side on local streets for the safe route routes. And we're talking about then gap in fill um, on, on those, those segments. Gotcha, but I would, I mean, we didn't, we haven't gone back to look, but I imagine it'd be cool to go back and look and to see based on those areas, how much percentage of sidewalk ratio we have, like if that impacts kids walking and biking, or if it's more of a function of, hey, nobody's here to take you to school, out the door you go, you know. That's, that's been a big benefit on 19th Street. Mm. As kids are on both sides of the street, right? Yeah, get across that street at all, particularly as busy as it gets. Yeah, because they're going up down to Quarterly and over to the junior high. <sighs> so, um, public health coordinates with USD 497 every year to do travel tallies where they go into a lot of classrooms, they ask kids how to get to school. Um, and this is the overall summary results kind of of those schools. So you can see in fall of 14, we started and we were at about 14.3. And then um, and our, we're all the way up in fall of 21 to 22.2% of kids who indicated they walked or biked to school. Um, national average, I think, is quite low. It's gone because of COVID. Yeah, we didn't collect data that year. They're getting ready to do these again. They do them in September, the fall ones, and they're working, public health is working right now. It will in 2020. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. The school is in you know, <laughs> Yeah. Um, we also, though, sorry, back to that other data. We, we did parent surveys. Um, we do the we do those typically in a planning process, but that asks some questions that I'm going to show you the results to. And then we did some school crossing guard counts to understand what was happening. A lot of crossing guards locations got placed over time, and then they were never removed, but they necessarily didn't no longer they no longer met the warrants of the program. So they didn't justify either having enough kids to walk or bike there, or the densities changed within the boundaries. There was no ever conversation, and that comes into some recommendations we made and some changes that have happened. So, Okay, so we asked, um, this is the, from the parent survey, and it asked people really to identify for us to help us understand what are barriers or motivating factors um, that are, impact your kid's ability uh, to walk or bike to and from school. Um, and so you can see presence and quality of sidewalks um, are pretty big factors that are um, motivating um, and um, there, you know, there's some stuff you can, we can see where we may have less impact on it again, weather, climate, time, somebody's personal time, um, distance, obviously, a little basic policy question. Um, but I think that kind of gives you an idea, and we use this to drive the narrative and conversation about the work we're doing in Safe Routes to School programming. Next. Okay. So we work with the district to get anonymous student information. We don't... Um, we're showing you this as an example. We don't publish all of these maps. It changes from year to year. Remember, we're on a five-year cycle for updating. We also have provisions that if the numbers change, we will go back and revisit these. This gives you an example, though, of showing you kind of where the density falls in relationship um, to Billy Mills. And you can see as a result gets us thinking about in yellow over here, we had the previous safe routes to school route. We looked at that, oh, the density pocket that's happening. We really need to plan a future. Uh, future route, and you can see the proposed route is in blue, um, and as a result, that changes. Another thing we also look at for every school is walk sheds. So we have a model built that has all of the sidewalk net, si existing sidewalk network and street connectors and crossings, and we basically take um, from the school, let's go a half a mile in half mile increments and show you what that distance is and what um, percentage of we can incorporate within those spaces, recognizing again, the farther you get out and the um, lower the age, the less likely you're gonna have kids walking and biking, particularly if they have to do it alone. But these are the two things that we look at and um, and put if you put them together all on one map, it gets really crazy. But um, we do that and we have them on a the screen and we're looking at these as we're trying to prioritize, okay, if we're looking at routes, where should we prioritize our investment of sidewalk or crossing improvements 
based on those routes. And so that's been the evolution now of how we've established and evolved those safe routes to school routes that we're working on. Um, so we so we did all of this work and put proposed routes out and had our sur survey from our parent survey and we hosted an open house and we had very low attendance and so we said okay this isn't what we need to do so instead we went back and contacted the schools and went to visit either the PTO or the PTA at every school or at least we asked to um, and based on what they told us would be best for their school we went and did all those visits we provided them packets of engagement that gave that laid out all of the stuff we were kind of looking for guidance on. Um, and so in some cases, they had some different options for choices um, and ways to connect things. And we wanted to get that information directly from that school to help us make that decision. And so we did that um, in relationship to all of these tools and packets. We also had them all online that people could find. Um, but most of the engagement came out of our work going to specific school sites and help to having those PTOs or PTAs specifically recruit engagement from their school for us. That's very time intensive. Were you the, if you were the queen of the world, how many people do you need in your department? Because, I mean, I, I, it just seems evident that, maybe seems evident to me, maybe, that you are not a priority in this county if there are only two of you and two interns and you are charged with doing I mean, the, the things that you were doing. Uh, so part of that staffing level function is a result of the federal funding we get. And you'll be pleased to know that we are getting more money. And so there may be some things in store for us in the future. I was thinking about- But that's a federal-, federal. <laughs> A hologram of you at the schools in Paul. And, I mean, I- yeah, it's I mean, we evident. have a lot of capacity. I mean, we have built capacity. We Our interns are not making coffee. Yeah. And they have really good job placement because of it. <laughs> For the record, I make the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you just delegate everything. <laughs> And part of it's about bringing the right people together to start having these conversations and to make decisions and be willing to kind of say, okay, here's what it is. Let's move on and keep doing this work. It helps that it's on a cycle. We're not, you know, we're on a five-year cycle. So we're not starting over. We're saying, here's our process. What didn't work last time? How do we recreate this? What else can we do? Um, yeah, we do the best we can do. I, you know, in, in addition to their day jobs, they have to show up for these <laughs> You don't have to just do talk about doing yes. Speaking of that, we have about 12 minutes. Okay, so yeah. we'll try to hurry. So again, we have goals from each of those areas. We talked about the percentage increase and then about completing the network because those are the really uh critical things and, and how we should do that. Okay, we realized from the first time we planned, we only made one set of maps, and that was misleading. So what we did in this plan is we developed infrastructure maps, which is our plan plans. And then we developed encouragement, a new set of encouragement maps, because that's about what we give to people to walk and bike. So we don't want to show a safe route if it's only a future safe route and there's no sidewalk on it. So having one set of maps, you can see now how that's problematic, especially when we show projects that may not still happen for a number of years. People may say, oh, that's going to be built next year. No, that's so we have different maps. And we also realized at each of the schools, we really would benefit from having traffic circulation maps. And we have at, we made requests to all the schools to get all, a lot of this information. Not every school has given it to us, um, and it hasn't necessarily been coordinated at the district level, but we have made them for every school that has given us information. And then they can use these beautiful generated maps Just to go to the next slide. Okay, well, I'll show you on another slide. Um, here's kind of the routes um, community-wide. Um, so some sections... So when we look at totals later, some sections may contribute to part of a, a middle school route, but also an elementary route. But here is the network of streets um, that is prioritized for two sides of sidewalk on collector and arterial and one side on local streets. Um, we have a lot of recommendations in this plan. So if you remember, we're going back to think holistically. It's about people told us it's about how they, how comfortable they feel. So how people are driving and a lot of these types of programs um, like neighborhood traffic management and our school area traffic control policy are impacting the things 
policy wise that are happening on the streets in general, just across neighborhoods. And because we have neighborhood schools, that's valuable. We did establish um, in 2021 an updated school area traffic control policy, which had some evaluation for school crossing guards in a more regular program, um, which has allowed for us to the city to be more adaptive in deploying um, those resources. So we talk about traffic circulation maps. Here's an example of this. We work to develop these and public health hosts them on their website. They have a page for each school. So if your school gave us information or had information that we could digitize in a way, we standardized all of those to kind of communicate this information. Um, some schools had hand-drawn notes. Some schools had written directions that I would try to interpret. And I'm like, I don't know. And so this was really to help bring some uh, resource of mapping um, to, to those schools. Um, we recognize crossings both in safe routes and in the pedestrian plane as one of the most challenging points of um, contention for comfort. Um, and so we have some recommendations about some safe routes to school crossing improvements and, and implementing them into non-motorized prioritization and develop a crossing policy and multimodal transportation commission is working on that right now. They just had a study session about uh, crossings and policy design. There's a consultant working on, on a, a small project for that. So there's some work happening on these things, which is really exciting. Um, Again, we talked about that crossing guard program for safe routes and uh, evaluating some of that yearly, and we're doing that. Okay, constructing and maintaining routes. So all a lot of the work, safe routes to schools are prioritized in the non-motorized prioritization process. That's how a lot of those um, segments have gotten infilled and prioritized in infill. Um, that's also been largely driven by a lot of success that the city has had in getting awarded transportation alternative grants from the state of Kansas. So um, between Safe Routes to School and the Lawrence Loop over the last five years, on average, they've gotten a million dollars a year. And that's that's huge um, in terms of bike ped investment. And so a lot of work is being done on stand. Those are all standalone bike ped projects. And so um, that's really exciting. And I think there's continued conversation about even maintenance and ADA and sidewalk improvement that is just going to benefit kids walking and biking to school, assuming we have neighborhood schools. Okay, we went to work with, uh, we developed an MOU between the city and USD 497 about how we're all going to work together. Um, and we have a, a kind of an informal working group because of that, um, that meets as needed to do, to coordinate and do all this work because there's a lot of individual partners doing each of these pieces. Um, Again, this is kind of the culture of walking and biking. These are some of our best practices and recommendations. Some of these things are happening. Some of, their, some of them aren't. Um, you can just kind of keep going through this. Here's the encouragement maps um, that public, we work on the map side based on existing conditions of where sidewalks are and what the routes are and where crossing guards are, uh, information for and show what a half mile walk is to your school. And then public health put together in partnership um, this information to kind of give um, that information That's really awesome out to parents and those this is a very time consuming yeah. summer process yeah. these are hosted on the um we've had staff changes that have kind of impacted our timeline for some of these but these all should be hosted on the public health website and then schools have access to that That's brilliant. um so yeah so again we work to um track progress you know we're looking at the inventories of networks we also have i didn't talk about it at all but there's some bikeway projects related to safe routes so thinking about how that impacts because there's some things like bike boulevards or probably slower streets that would also impact how kids walk or bike to school um and then the process to amend we recommend there's also some other best practices um that we have less control over two of which are you know really having school champions at schools to to work on some of the cultural things or think about how you know walking school buses can really impact walking and biking rates to school which um there's not a process for that really and so it would have to be community advocate driven site school specific that sort of thing and then overall just considerations about walking and biking before new schools are cited or boundary changes are made. We recognize that as a huge part of why we are able to have done and have success doing the work we've done is because there are neighborhood schools. So when um, the school district talks about boundary changes, um, I mean, do they meet with you? Do they talk with you? Do they Amy bring Miller and our division represents um, planning and development services on school boundary change committee. But um, 
Ron May from USD 497, who is the operations. I mean, he has he serves on our steering committee, so he has access to all of the tools we developed as part of these processes as information resource to him. To the extent they use that, I yeah, that's I'm wondering what how deep these conversations are when I, school boundaries are being. I have never about. been asked to participate, so I don't. Okay. You said earlier about some kids don't have bicycles. I see on TV every once in a while, some hero takes all the used bicycles, refurbishes them, and ends them up. Do we have anything like that in the Lawrence area? We do. There's a local community nonprofit called Lawrence Unchained, and they're a bicycle cooperative, and they do repair bikes and do bike giveaways targeted particularly with housing authority last I knew. Um, they also have an earn a bike program and um, sell used bicycles that they repair to help do this for a nonprofit. I believe there's also some larger programs, maybe related to Lions Club, but I'm not sure how those, I'm not, I'm not necessarily privy to that information. And how do people <laughs> find out about any of these, whether it's Lions Club or the other? Well, I see a lot of posts often on Facebook, Facebook type groups in community stuff, like people saying, oh, this kid needs a bike or and people responding like by whatever things. Other than that, I don't know. Okay. It's kind of, Back to the school question, did, did I read in the paper that I'm trying to think that there's a consultant maybe looking at school populations in terms of um, enrollment issues in the school district? And I'm wondering if that's a way to, I mean, in, what, in whatever that discussion is about which built what to do with the old buildings, what to do with existing buildings. I forget, I don't know exactly what that conversation is. Might that be a worthy conversation to have to bring it, in? It could be. I mean, if they're doing some of that forecasting work, it just depends if they do it spatially. I mean, they have all the student information. So it's very possible that they could ask their consultant to work with us in terms of the model that we've built for sidewalks to be able to mm -hmm. do some of that scenario modeling. Mm -hmm. um, Changing school district boundaries just eats people up in, a, in an instant. Uh, talk about changing the school boundaries. Yeah. Okay. So as a result of that, you can see where all the routes are in gray. The gaps or projects are identified here in sidewalk projects. So you can see we don't have too, too, too many left, but you can see there's probably some critical segments in some places. Some things we anticipate, um, you know, the 19th Street, the this section of Wakarusa with SL, you know, with SLT project, there's some things that will happen as part of development, other parts that um, will need to be standalone projects. So the gray that those are future projects. Now, to the, the gray on this one is the routes. The, oh, the route. Okay. The route. So like that's the what was in yellow on the previous okay. slide. Now it's just in gray because we want to show you how the connections are made. Okay. But now the um the blue is if it's a gap on one side of a local street. The green is if it's on a collector or arterial, both sides, and the brown is if it's on a collector or arterial on one side of the street. So I'm just thinking, yeah. so the Ninth Street, Street is just problematic. Yeah. So. so the prioritization methodology, though, has um, some scoring that prioritizes different factors to, to target um, some of those projects. So thinking about transportation disadvantaged populations, we've now incorporated some of that equity consideration into waiting for that scoring. So to try to prioritize sidewalk gap infill for project selection where we believe there are populations that would most benefit from the need to walk or bike to school. So, yeah. Great. All of our plans are online at our website. And then the um, that's the public health website that gets you to the link kind of of all the school pages um, and the content that public health maintains as a partner in safe routes. Brilliant. Yep. Good job. So much. Thank you. Good <laughs> job. Yeah. 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 This is the work that we do. So this is <laughs> part, part of the thank work. Thank you. Really <laughs> really impressive. Yes. Thank you for your time. Usually at these meetings, what, what are we looking at? 
for planning commission meetings this month? Two nights, one night? This month, I believe we're looking at two nights. Okay. I don't have the bit of paper that's got that in front of me, but I remember I think tonight is two nights. And I thought it, that September was going to be heavy. Yeah, I think it's stacked on both nights. Yay. <laughs> now, usually we always had the mid month when we got kind of a quick overview of what was coming what was what was coming so yeah we need to get back in the now uh, that we're back at our first in person mid month maybe we can get we'll try to add that back in yeah thanks for that we need to get back in the routine we've kind of lost it over the yeah. two and a half years <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i think we got about two two full nights if my memory serves correctly yay great thank you guys so much really good. thank you thank you um, we have, we have other plans for the future so if you yeah. have other stuff you would like to hear from us about we are happy to come talk about any of the work that we have done the other thing that most may be most relevant to you is the pedestrian plan if you want to hear much about like to see yeah. it, yeah. always happy to talk about sidewalks and David can <laughs> present that one <laughs> Go off on a rant or whatever. <laughs> I try not to rant. <laughs> so, right, the meeting that starts here at night, we need to clear the room before we yeah. so I just want to ask before we jump, is there anyone online that has any comments to make before we go? That, uh, without objection, we'll call this close. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much.